Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is, and namaste. Uh, welcome to episode 136 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. For the next half hour, I'm going to be telling you about a couple of things that uh, I hope you'll be interested in. Uh, as always, comments, questions, and reactions can be sent to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And uh, otherwise, you can go to my website, which is Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can get the email address from there, or you can leave a comment there. If you do email me, please make sure to include something like, you know, left side of the aisle or whatever in the subject line so I know it's not spam, and be a little patient about getting an answer. Um, this is going to be a little bit unusual uh, this week in a couple of ways. One is that there's only two things I'm going to be talking about, a, one, uh, one, a shorter item before the break and a longer one after. And uh, the other thing is that this is episode 136. It's for the week following Thanksgiving. Uh, and I've been doing the show for 136 weeks, uh, over two and a half years. And in fact, if you count the two live shows we did for the open houses, I've done 138 shows in 136 weeks. So I deserve a week off. And I'm taking one. So next week, this the, the, uh, the first week in December, is that um, now not going to be here, going to be a new show. So the next show will be two weeks from now, not one. All right, so any event, I'm going to start off. I have a more than unusually heartfelt RIP this week. Uh, this one is for Bonnie. She's a, a border collie, or or rather she was, since uh, you, um, you, know, you surely knew that because this is an RIP. Um, and she, yes, she did die recently. It's, it's hard to know exactly what to say to eulogize a family pet, particularly since there are you know, some people who don't see the point of doing it at all. Uh, someone just said to me recently that people who don't have dogs just sometimes don't realize how much a part of your family that uh, animal can become. Because the family dog is not just a pet, not just a possession, not just a, a source of entertainment, not just a hobby. Um, it's family. And when it's gone, there's a real hole in your family, a hole just as real as with the loss of any other family member. Now, I'm not going to suggest to you, I've got a hint that the hole left by the loss of a pet, a loss of a family dog, is as large, as wide, or as deep, anywhere near that, uh, as would be caused by the loss of a human family member. I'm not, not even going to hint that. I am going to tell you, however, that that hole is just as real. Uh, now, Bonnie was, even by the standards of sweetness reserved for gentle dogs, she was incredibly sweet. Uh, a neighbor uh, helping us take her to the vet asked if uh, he should be concerned if she would bite. And uh, my wife and I realized that we actually couldn't even think of a time when she even looked like she was thinking about biting somebody. Uh, in fact, the only time that her teeth ever touched my hand in the whole in the whole 10 years we had her was when I mean this is other when I was trying to get a pill down her but uh, one time I was holding up a treat and she was jumping up to get it and she missed at the same time though uh, she was very gentle but she was also very protective no one came to our house without us knowing about it and there was one time when there was uh, some some actually innocent horseplay going on, uh, but it looked serious from the outside, and she actually tried to intervene. She actually tried to force her way between these two people. Bonnie was a, a pound pup, or more properly, I should say, a, um, a pound dog. Uh, we got her when she was two. We got her from the Humane Society. I don't remember why we decided to uh, adopt a dog. I, don't, I actually don't remember why. Um, we, just, we just did. I do remember going to adopt her though. Circumstances and finances meant that we could only adopt one dog. So we had to choose one. And we went through the kennel looking at the dogs. And she was just the one. She was. She was just the one. Uh, you know, we even tried to interest ourselves, even tried to actively consider other dogs, just to make sure this wasn't a snap decision. But it always came back to her. She just, she was the one. Um, actually, maybe this was a snap decision. Sometimes those are the best kind. She was with us for 10 years across five homes in two states. Gentle, playful, smart. She was the family dog. Uh, she was Bonnie. 
We gave her what we could, love, attention, and good care. The one thing we couldn't give her, again due to circumstances, was as much exercise as she would have wanted. Uh, remember, she was a border collie. She lived to run. I'm sure that if she ever was somehow able to make a personal highlight reel of her life, in most of those clips, she'd be running. Now we knew she was getting on. She was mostly deaf and getting a bit frail. She could no longer keep up with her younger playmate, who's a Jack Russell Terrier. But her eyes still sparkled. And after a bout of well, actually, we don't know what it was, uh, but whatever it was, she obviously wasn't feeling well for a time, but after that passed, she regained her old enthusiasm. Then one morning, she couldn't stand up. Her back legs would not support her, and we discovered she had been incontinent. Now, after a while, oddly enough, she was able to stand and even walk a bit, but she kept falling, and even when she could stand, she, started, she was just wandering aimlessly around the house. And after a couple of minutes of that, we realized that she was blind. She very likely had had a very major stroke. So she was blind, nearly deaf, at least partially incontinent, and only intermittently able to stand. It was time her time. This is especially after the vet confirmed by the time we got her to the vet that her back legs were completely paralyzed and she didn't even respond to deep pain stimulus there. So we had her euthanized. And you know, I don't particularly like that word. I, I don't know what to call it when you do this. Uh, um, euthanized, I mean, it's accurate, but it seems so clinical, technical. It seems like so emotionless. Um, killed, on the other hand, is in some ways even more accurate, but it's really way too harsh. I, I just can't deal with that one. Uh, put to sleep is absurd. She's not asleep. She's dead. And the one I really, really, really hate is put down. You know, she was a 10-year companion, and, 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 and as I remarked to someone just recently, even at my age, 10 years is a long time. She was a 10-year companion, not a damn suitcase or a shopping bag, like she was a burden that we were glad to be relieved of. So I guess I'm stuck with euthanized as the best of a bad lot. So we had her euthanized. We were there for the procedure. It was none of this, you know, the dog goes into another room and a miracle happens for us. Um, we said our goodbyes to her, which is really for us, of course, not for her, because she was, probably, she was mostly deaf and probably didn't even hear us. Um, but uh, at least hopefully she was aware of the presence of warm, comforting hands and maybe even our smell, familiar smell. But in any event, we said our goodbyes. We had her cremated, something I wish was done more often, and I include for people, too. Uh, and we are, at least for now, keeping the ashes. Maybe at some point we'll decide on an appropriate place to scatter or bury those ashes, but that's for the future to decide. For the moment, um, we're still saying our goodbyes and still aware of that hole. Her ashes are in a box, and uh, sitting around that box is her collar. And on top of the box is a small model of a yeoman's farmhouse. So this is one of those David Winter houses. I, I don't know if you remember, he was popular a few years ago, or several years ago, um, maybe still is, I don't know. But these are actually very well-crafted miniatures of things, of basically English and Scottish things. And a yeoman farmer, by the way, is a farmer who is of some substance. They own their own land and so on. So he's got this yeoman farmer's house there. And so here's the deal. If you believe in an afterlife, particularly one for pets, do me a favor. Don't uh, picture Bonnie in that afterlife with us. Picture her at that yeoman farmer's house, spending her days running around the sheep and chasing birds out of the wheat field, and spending her evenings curled up in front of a warm fire, dreaming of doing the same things. That would be her heaven. So, R.I.P. Bonnie, and uh, we're coming back after the break. And welcome back. Here we are. Um, this week, again, the show is going to be shown the week after Thanksgiving. So, as a special Thanksgiving treat for you, a special Thanksgiving tea day present, gather around the campfire. I'm going to tell you the story of the true story of the first Thanksgiving, which wasn't the first and it wasn't a Thanksgiving. 
Now, there have been a number of places that have claimed to have had the first Thanksgiving, but when we think of the first Thanksgiving, that event, we're thinking of a specific event that took place in Plymouth in the fall of 1621. So yes, that's what I'm referring to. Uh, in telling the story, I'm going to begin by citing a book with the rather ponderous title of A Relation or Journal of the Beginning and Proceedings of the English Plantation Settled at Plymouth in New England by Certain English Adventurers, Both Merchants and Others. It's popularly known today by the less cumbersome title of Mort's Relation. Now, in that volume was published in England in 1622, and it includes a letter from Edward Winslow to a loving and old friend in England. Now, Edward Winslow was a Mayflower passenger, he was one of the original settlers. He became an important figure in the town uh, before he moved back to England some decades later. Anyway, this letter is dated December 11th, 1621. This is quoted from that letter. Our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling, so that we might, after a special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruits of our labors. They four killed in one day killed as much as much fowl as with a little help besides served the company almost a week. At which time, amongst other recreations, we exercised our arms, many of the Indians coming amongst us, and among the rest their greatest king, Massasoit, with some ninety men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted. And they went out and killed five deer, which they brought to the plantation, and bestowed on our governor and upon the captain and others. And although it be not always so plentiful as it was at this time with us, yet by the great goodness of God we are so far from want that we often wish you partakers of our plenty." Okay, got that? All right, the first thing you need to know, friends, is that that is the only contemporaneous account of the event known to exist. The only other even near contemporaneous account, uh, of, which, of which I or, or historians are aware, uh, was penned by William Bradford. He was another first comer, Mayflower passenger. He actually became governor of the colony for 30 some odd years. He wrote in the early 1630s, which means it was 10 or 12 years after the fact. He said, I'm quoting, they began now to gather in the small harvest they had, and to fit up their houses and dwellings against winter, being all recovered, well recovered in health and strength, and had all things in good plenty. For as some were thus employed in affairs abroad, others were exercised in fishing, about cod and bass and other fish, of which they took good store, of which every family had their portion. All the summer there was no want, and now began to come in store of fowl as winter approached, of which this place did abound when they came first, but afterwards decreased by degrees. And besides waterfowl, there was great store of wild turkeys, of which they took many, besides venison, etc. Besides, they had about a peck of meal a week to a person, or now since harvest, Indian corn to that proportion, which made many afterwards write so largely of their plenty here to their friends in England, which were not feigned but true reports." That's it. That's all factually that we actually know. Well, that and the fact that based on other references in those same two sources, the 1621 feast took place after September 18th and before November 9th. Most likely it was late September or early October as that would have been shortly after harvest. Everything else is based on assumptions, interpretations, and guesswork. Some of the guesswork informed, too much of it not. Now, the first thing to realize is that this was not a Thanksgiving, and the period of Thanksgiving was a religious occasion set aside to uh, give thanks to God for some special and unexpected blessing, and it was not a time for a big feast. Uh, now, such days, such Thanksgiving days, would occur as the cause arose. To plan for one every year would have been regarded as a gross presumption on God's plan. What this was instead was not a thanksgiving. It was a very traditional, very secular, very English harvest feast. It was a tradition that if you had a good harvest, you would have a feast to celebrate to which you would invite everyone who had been helpful to you in your fields that year. And the natives had been helpful, so they were there. Now, it's true the settlers did not have a good harvest. Bradford calls it small, but they had a harvest. At that point, they knew they were going to survive. They figured, yeah, we're going to make it. And that was reason enough for a celebration. Now, as for the eternal question of what they ate, we actually don't know for certain because nothing's specified, but we can make some pretty good guesses. They surely could have had fish, specifically cod and bass. 
Waterfowl, duck and goose were also quite possible, and yes, they probably did have turkey. As Bradford says, they took many, and they were, so they were certainly available. They may have had deer. Bradford mentions venison, which in the period actually meant hunted meat, but obviously includes deer. And plus the fact there's the reference to the natives bringing five deer. The, it's just, it's not absolutely clear whether or not they brought them to the feast, they went out and got them during the feast, or whether it was actually after the feast that they brought these kind of like a thank you for the feast and the entertainment. So, but they may well have had venison either supplied by the natives or otherwise. Uh, lobster, other shellfish, that's also a good possibility. Elsewhere in that same Winslow letter that I quoted, he says they're plentiful in the area. And so are eels, which you may go, Ugh, but in the period, any English person would have just said, it's just another sort of fish. Uh, Winslow actually says you could take a hogshead of eels in a night. Now, a hogshead is a kind of large barrel that holds 63 gallons of fluid, so yeah, that's probably an exaggeration, but... Winslow was prone to that. Uh, more tentatively, there could have been a sort of pie made from squash uh, from their gardens, sweetened with dried fruit imported from England. Um, uh, salads made from other stuff in the garden uh, was a real possibility too. To drink, it was most likely water. Uh, again, in that same letter, Winslow says that the barley grew indifferent good. That it was a so-so crop, not great, but not you know bad. And there's no mention of hops. Well, if you don't have hops, you can't make beer. And if you don't have much barley, you can't make a lot of ale. So they may have had some ale, but probably it was mostly water. So that's pretty much it, kiddies. Not much to build a mythology on, is it? All right, now for the reason I bring this whole story up. Every year around this time, unfailingly, I come across some revisionist histories of the event. Now, years ago in grammar school, I, along with everybody else, was, was uh, fed tales that roused images of noble settlers and savage natives, and now there are those who simply want to flip that to a tale of noble natives and savage settlers. They still want to have angels and demons, they just want to flip the roles. We're regaled with tales of bloodthirsty settlers and how Massasoit brought 90 men to the feast because he was afraid that without a massive show of force, he might be kidnapped or killed which is bunk, pure and simple. In fact, relations between Plymouth and the neighboring natives was reasonably good for several decades. There were stresses and strains, yes, and a few breakdowns, but for the most part, they managed to keep intact the peace and mutual defense treaty that they had created in the spring of 1621. Things gradually got worse. I won't get to all the reasons why. The two big ones were population pressure and disputes over land, which uh, disputes rooted in vast cultural differences between the natives and the settlers. See, the natives did not have a concept of land ownership. That idea did not exist in their culture. It's not that they didn't own the land or the land belonged to everybody. No, just land was not a possession. It couldn't be a possession. To a native of the period, to own something meant you could pick it up and carry it away with you. How can you own something if you have to leave it behind every time you go anywhere? Which makes sense, especially if you're a semi-nomadic people who live in one area at some parts of the year and in another area other parts of the year. But of course, to any European, to any English settler, land ownership is an everyday concept. Now the peace finally, irrevocably, totally broke down, but that was in 1675, more than 50 years after the first Thanksgiving. The point here in any event is that at that time, in the, in the fall of 1621, settler-native relations were good. In fact, that Winslow letter I quoted, okay, the very next sentences of that same letter are these. We have found the natives very faithful in their covenant of peace with us, very loving and ready to pleasure us. We often go to them and they come to us. Some of us have been 50 miles by land in the country with them. Winslow also says that all the other native leaders in the area have made peace with Plymouth on the same terms as Massasoit, and as a result of which he asserts, there is now great peace amongst the Indians themselves, which was not formerly. He goes on to say, we, for our parts, walk as peaceably and safely in the wood as in the highways of England. We entertain them familiarly in our houses, and they as friendly bestowing their venison on us. They are a people without any religion or knowledge of God, yet very trusty, quick of apprehension, ripe-witted, just. And 
just to be certain that you know, uh, quick of apprehension does not mean quick to be afraid. It means quick to grasp the meaning of something, quick to understand. Now, frankly, that does not sound like bloodthirsty settlers either eager to kill natives or like natives who feared contact with those same settlers or felt they had to display mass force in order to avoid being kidnapped or killed. If you're still not convinced, consider that in June 1621, three or four months before this event, the town felt it necessary to send a message to Massasoit requesting that he restrain his people from coming to the settlement in such numbers. This is from March Relation. This is the message they sent to him. But whereas his people came very often, and very many together unto us, bringing for the most part their wives and children with them, they were welcome, yet we being but strangers as yet at Patuxet, alias New Plymouth, and not knowing how our corn might prosper, we could no longer give them such entertainment as we had done, and as we desired still to do. That's how afraid the natives were of the settlers. Simply flipping who was an angel and who was a demon in this is trash. Neither of these people were either. Neither was a saint, neither was a devil. Well, okay, this year I came across an, a, a new, or at least recent, historical revisionist history, one which unfortunately appears to be gaining some traction in some very unfortunate places. This, too, is about why Massasoit was at the feast with 90 of his men. Now, why that seems to be a point of contention, why people can't seem to simply embrace the idea that they were there because they were expected, mystifies me, but let's leave that aside for now. The thing is, note that Winslow says that, amongst other recreations, we exercised our arms. This new revisionist notion is that some natives nearby to Plymouth heard the noise of the militia exercising, took it to mean that Plymouth is under attack, and ran and told Massasoit, who rushed to Plymouth with his men, ready to support his ally and honor the Mutual Defense Treaty. That's why they were there. Now, this is a sort of innocent revisionism in that it doesn't challenge the nature of the relations between Plymouth and Massasoit's people. In fact, it sort of reinforces it. And it doesn't change the essential story except like to play up the natives' intentions to keep their word or to hint, as some have in the past, that Massasoit had a sort of fatherly attitude toward this handful of clueless doofuses out at the coast, which actually is not too likely since he also would have been well aware about how those same doofuses had stared down Massasoit's enemy, the Narragansett, the previous spring. But again, the revisionism here reflects only the details. It doesn't reflect the, it doesn't affect the basic thrust of the story. But the thing is, while it may be harmless, the fact is it is almost certainly complete nonsense. First, we have to suppose that the natives who thought Plymouth were under attack ran to tell Massasoit without ever checking to see if it was true. Second, Massasoit's chief town, Poconocet, was 40 miles away, allowing time to get there, assemble a force, and get back to Plymouth, I think we're safely talking a day and a half. Now, Winslow says the natives were entertained and feasted for three days, which means that the feast is now not three days long, it's four or five days long, which is getting pretty long. And third, it also means that all the time that Massasoit is on his way to Plymouth, he could, not, he could not have encountered a single native who said, what are you talking about? There's nothing going on there. They're just making a lot of noise. You know how they like to do that. The point is the story simply doesn't track. Now, this version is supposedly based on an oral tradition among the Wampanoag, and I say supposedly because um, I don't know of any references to this tradition before a relatively few years ago. In an admittedly, by no means in-depth search, but the earliest reference I came to this was 2006. And when I worked at Plymouth Plantation in the late 18, uh, 1980s and uh, uh, 1990s, including at the native site, no one ever mentioned this tradition. So, but perhaps maybe it is an actual oral tradition, something to be consciously preserved, not just a story that gets tossed around that's subject to being, you know, revised or reinvented even over a short period of time. Oral traditions can be very useful, they can be very accurate. But the fact is, when a nearly 400-year-old oral tradition directly conflicts with contemporaneous written accounts, I can't put a lot of credence in it. And again, take note of Winslow's account, written several weeks after the event. It betrays not the slightest hint of surprise that Massasoit's uh, people came. 
And as I've already noted, Edward Winslow was not one to downplay events or be reticent in his descriptions. If anything, he was prone to, to some exaggeration. If there is any truth to the account that the natives came expecting to go into battle, what possible reason, what possible rational basis could there have been for Winslow to have not said something like, Massasoit with some 90 of his men came upon us all of a sudden prepared for battle, having heard reports that we were under attack. But having assuaged their fears, we bid them join the feast. Why wouldn't he have said that? Particularly since in describing other events, Winslow was not particularly miserly with details. The only rational reason I can think of is that it didn't happen. So I reject the revisionist histories. Indeed, I resent the revisionist histories. I resent them first because they're lousy history. They are based on ideology, not information, and they look to satisfy demands of political belief, not of history. And they're every bit as full of false tales and mythology as the tales and pap that we got fed as school children. And there's something else. There's another reason. The first Thanksgiving was a moment of celebration when everyone on both sides, even if they're still a little wary of each other, everyone on both sides really figured this is going to work out. Now that wasn't going to happen. It was a false hope, even a foolish hope. It doesn't change the fact that it did exist. And considering what Europeans of various sorts have inflicted on the natives of North America over the ensuing couple of centuries, there really is no need to do any exaggerations. So I quite frankly resent the attempts to strip away that one moment of hope in pursuit of a modern political or social agenda. And I choose to express that, sentiment, that resentment by laying out what we do know about the event, little though it may be. So, I hope you enjoyed your turkey day. I hope you had time to spend with your family or friends, or better yet, both. And I hope you can understand why I celebrate the day less as an expression of thankfulness for the past or even the present than as an expression of hope for the future. Now that hope may prove to be as foolish as that of 1621 was, but the blunt fact is hope is the only thing, it is the only force, it is the only energy that ultimately can make that future a better one. So that's it for me. That's it for me. Remember that uh, this is for the week after Thanksgiving. The week after that, I am taking off because I deserve it. Um, so we will see you in two weeks. In the meantime, you have the best week or best weeks you possibly can. And peace. <laughs>